Well, good evening and welcome to the evening live stream broadcast of the evening message from the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. As you can see, it's still Christmas at our house, um, but uh, we are uh, getting uh, close to changing things, so hopefully next week uh, we won't have to look at the tree at least as uh, we give the message, but uh, tonight it's still with us. Um, the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church is located at 6202 South Tyler Street here in Tacoma, Washington. And our usual Lord's Day services begin at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday morning with Sunday school. And those uh, classes are uh, live at the church, but they're also uh, streaming. So you can catch them there. Um, and then our morning worship service is 10.30 a.m. And uh, that also is a live service at the church, followed by, or rather, including also a live stream broadcast of that service. Our evening service for now is uh, not in person at the church, but continues to be live streamed uh, uh, on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock. Our uh, women's Bible study with appropriate uh, social distancing and so on uh, resumes uh, this Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. at the church. And if you need more details about that, you can certainly contact, contact us at the church. We'll be happy to tell you about that. And then small groups meet through the week. And uh, if you are interested in being a part of the small group, if you will contact us at the church, at 627-4814, we will uh, let you know um, where and when those small groups are meeting, and uh, you can join one and get to know our church family there. Glad to see that uh, Pam is with us tonight, and I uh, apologize for being slow getting on uh, line here tonight, uh, but uh, um, if you're just tuning in, um, you can uh, um, look for us to start the message here in about six or seven minutes. Um, if you're catching this at another time, you can skip ahead six or seven minutes from now, and you'll be in with the message. I see that Sue has joined us. Hi, Sue. It's good to have you with us, as well as Pam tonight. Uh, Sue, we hope you're doing well, and that... Uh, you are uh, having a good new year. This is a good time to uh, wish a happy new year to those who just join us in our evening services. Um, know that uh, that's not uh, always the same group that we have in the morning. So um, we're glad to have you with us uh, on at these evening messages. So, we'll be starting our evening message here in about five or six minutes from now. And uh, this is the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. I see the Andersons have joined us tonight. Good evening to the Andersons. Glad to have you with us this evening. See the Marcellias are with us now. And uh, um, glad to have them with us uh, this evening. Thank the Lord for our day today in God's house. It was a, a blessing to be there with the Lord's people and uh, to uh, hear uh, the robust um, agreement of our brother John Williams with our uh, membership covenant. It's a blessing to hear that in his testimony and song afterwards. This is the live stream of 
the evening message for the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. We're located at 6202 South Tyler Street here in Tacoma, Washington. Our Sunday uh, schedule is we have a Sunday school at the church at 9.30 a.m. Uh, it's a live presentation there. And uh, as long as we're uh, under the uh, number of folks we can have in the church, um, we uh, continue to meet that way. And we also, of course, live stream our Sunday school as well. Then at 10.30 a.m., we have our morning worship each Lord's Day. And then um, we uh, get together in the evenings, not live uh, at the church, but here uh, for a morning I mean, rather for an evening uh, message from the Word of God. Good to have the battles here with us now, and uh, Janet uh, Mullen as well. Welcome to Janet and Bob. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good to see the floods have signed on. Good to have you with us tonight, too. Um, those of you who know our home realize that we're slightly cramped for space with the, um, some of the changes we have made. And so uh, while we'd like to be in a different location, um, for right now, uh, you get the whole package to watch for at least one more week anyway. Thank you for your patience with that. This is the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church. This is our evening message. Um, the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church is lake located at 6202 South Tyler Street here in Tacoma. And uh, we are meeting here in the evenings on uh, Facebook and on YouTube, and we're glad uh, to have you with us, those of you who have signed in, and those of you who uh, have uh, tuned in but not signed in, we're glad to have you with us as well. Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church meets on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. for Sunday School at the church. That uh, Sunday School lesson is also uh, live streamed here uh, on YouTube. And then uh, uh, we have our morning worship service at 10.30 a.m. also on YouTube. And uh, then uh, we have our evening service, not live at the church, but we do have a message uh, that comes each Lord's Day evening at 6. So we're just about ready to get started tonight. Again, welcome to all of you who have signed on, and uh, we look forward now to spending a little time in God's Word together. Good evening, and uh, welcome grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and from his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're glad to have you with us tonight, and uh, we'll wish you, on behalf of the Tacoma Bible Presbyterian Church, a Happy New Year. Uh, if you're one of our regulars, you uh, heard that this morning, but um, if you're just one who joins us in the evening here in these messages, well, we wish that for you too, and our prayers are for uh, God's blessing upon you in the coming year. Our call to worship tonight, or our call to uh, give ourselves to the consideration of God's Word, comes from Psalm 28 and verses 6 and 7 this evening. The Psalm 28, verse 6 says, Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song I will praise him. Well, I'm not going to praise him with a song tonight, uh, except a song from my heart, but let's uh, praise him together in prayer. Our Father, we come before you tonight in the blessed name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather together in our Savior's name. And Lord, present ourselves before you uh, for the purpose of worship, for the purpose of prayer, and for the purpose, Lord, of fellowship. This sort of fellowship, the kind that comes uh, virtually like this, is, is different than uh, the fellowship we know when we gather together in your house. But Lord, we know that right now we're all under your eye. Lord, that uh, you can see us, and Lord, you know uh, the spirit of our hearts as we gather together. And Father, we have come to give heed and attention to your word. And Lord, we pray that uh, as we do, you will bless us. That Father, you'll speak to us out of your word and encourage us by your spirit in the word. Father, how thankful we are for redeeming grace. We were reminded this morning of uh, that wonderful and blessed promise of the covenant that our sins are forgotten and will never be remembered, not even into the farthest future, because of what Christ did for us at the cross of Calvary. And Father, we come bearing his name now and asking you to receive us as we are, sinners saved by grace, and to bless us as your covenant people. Be with all who are with us and those who are dear to us, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for scripture tonight, I'm going to be reading from 2 Chronicles chapter 30. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verses 1 to 11. And you may have been with us over the last few weeks when we were dealing with things related to the Advent season and to um, Herod and the wise men. But tonight we want to return to the story of Hezekiah. And so in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, beginning in verse 1, we read this. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, to keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel. So we're reading from Second Chronicles chapter 30, and now verse 2. For the king and his leaders and all the assembly in Jerusalem had agreed to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at the regular time, because a sufficient number of priests had not consecrated themselves, nor had the people gathered together at Jerusalem. And the matter pleased the king and all the assembly. So they resolved to make a proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba to Dan, that they should come to keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. Since they had not done it, for a long time in the prescribed manner. And you'll recall that the kingdom had split in two. Uh, tribes, Two tribes had remained faithful to David, or David's line, I should say. And the others had broken off and formed a northern kingdom. And Hezekiah is making a call to all of Israel, including both the northern and southern kingdoms. And we'll be talking about that in just a moment. In verse 6 we read, Then the runners went throughout all Israel and Judah with the letters from the king and his leaders, and spoke according to the command of the king. Children of Israel, return to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Then he will return to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the king of Assyria. And do not be like your brethren who trespassed against the Lord God of, your, of their fathers so that he gave them up to desolation, as you see. Now, do not be stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord and enter his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord, your brethren and your children will be treated with compassion by those who lead them captive, so that they may come back to this land, for the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn his face from you if you return to him. What a powerful proclamation. So the runners passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun. But they laughed at them and mocked them. Nevertheless, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun 
humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Let's pray again. Father, bless us now as we look again at the developing story before us here in the days of King Hezekiah. Help us by your grace to apply it to our own lives and hearts, Lord, and our own times. We thank you, Lord, that all these things were written for our admonition, for our instruction. And we pray, Lord, that we might receive them as such. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Many years ago, a soldier was taken prisoner, and he was sentenced to execution at dawn. He spent the night between several guards, and he was very agitated. He regretted getting captured, and, and he wished that there was some way to escape, and you can imagine that from anybody. But the encampment where he was being held was very secure, and uh, it wasn't likely that he was going to be able to get out. He tossed, and he turned, and he complained within himself about the situation. He dreamed of friends and family. He thought about just being able to spend one more day with his family and his friends. And suddenly, as he had been taken prisoner and realized he was going to die in the morning, all of those things became more precious to him. But because of the way he was being held and the camp he was in and, and the way it was secured, he didn't think it was possible. At one point, though, while he was tossing and turning over on his rough blanket that he'd spread out on the ground to keep him warm, he thought he spied someone moving in the darkness. So he remained very still, and peeking through his almost closed eyes, he kept looking to see if he really did see somebody or not. And sure enough, even though it was dark and, and he had, was lying still, there, there was a figure moving among the bushes. Well, he watched as the shadowy character crept closer and closer to him. The man was making strange motion, motions and odd faces at the prisoner. Now, the captive thought he saw a mocking grin from the man. And it came into his head that this fool had crept up in the night just to get where he could see him so that he could make fun of him and ridicule him. Well, two could play at that game. And he jumped up and with derision began challenging uh, his tormentor to come out from the bushes and confront him like a man. And he mocked him for being a coward and a fool. And he said, at least I'm here. I may be a prisoner, but I'm here because I was willing to stand up for what I believe in. And he went on and on like that yelling at this figure that was now long gone. He was so loud and violent that it aroused much of the, much of the camp. But, as I said, the, the shadowy figure had disappeared in the night. The captive was secured again, and he returned to tossing and turning on his bed, satisfied that if he could do nothing else, he could at least keep himself from being mocked. He was restless until morning, and then he was taken, and he was executed. It was later revealed that the man who had been making faces at him and gesturing to him in the darkness was smiling, not in mockery, but because he was a friend who had come to rescue him, a friend who had found a way through the borders of that secured encampment without arousing the guards. And he was simply pleased with himself, and that's why he was smiling. And what he was gesturing to him was, come on, come on, we'll get out of here. But the man couldn't see that. He couldn't hear that. He was just happy that he was able to save his friend. The poor prisoner went to his death, not knowing how close he had come to being liberated. His pride and his anger and his prejudice prevented him from being able to see what was really going on. It's something like this with men and women and the gospel. 
instead of stopping and listening to the message and trying to understand and hear what's being said to them, they respond out of anger and, and prejudice and, and they presume they know what they're being told and they react with derision to their own tragic loss because they can't hear it because they don't want to hear it and because they're offended by it. And so when believers come and try to share the gospel with them, they're prone to mock them and to not hear what we're trying to say when we're bringing to them a great message of salvation and eternal liberation from sin and death. The same sort of foolishness keeps many of the men and women in Israel from seeing and understanding the importance of the gesture that Hezekiah is making here. We just read it together, and we read about how the message went out, and many responded to that message from Hezekiah with mockery and derision. This is, they're in the midst of a revival. It's recorded here in this 30th chapter. And in the midst of this revival that is unfolding, their resistance is sad to witness. They don't want to hear it. So we start tonight with the decision on the part of Hezekiah to keep the Passover. We're told in Hezekiah, sent to all Israel and Judah, and also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, or Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord God of Israel. For the king and his leaders and all the assembly in Jerusalem had agreed to keep the Passover in the second month. But they could not keep it at the regular time because a sufficient number of priests had not cons uh, consecrated themselves, nor had the people gathered together at Jerusalem. Now, the Passover, as, as most of you know, was unique to Israel. But it was much more than just a unique kind of festival or celebration. It had been required by God among all Israel for specific reasons. It was, first of all, a memorial, a yearly reminder of God's grace and goodness to them in delivering them from the hand of their enemies in Egypt and delivering them into the land of promise. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 14, Exodus 12, 14, we read this. So this day shall be to you a memorial. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. It wasn't just for one generation, but it was for all the generation of the Jews. And if ever a generation needed to hear of God's covenant mercy, it was this generation in the days of Hezekiah. This generation about to lose their freedom, about to lose their nation, and about to lose their, their spiritual freedom to worship the living God, the one and true living God. They needed to hear about the covenant and God's relationship to them and the power and the freshness and the blessing of that relationship. Now I'm in Exodus chapter 12, and we're going to read verse 17. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this same day, I will have brought your enemies out of the land, or excuse me, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. You know, in this age of grace, there are no mandatory holy days other than, of course, the Lord's Day. All the others we're free to acknowledge or we're free to ignore. It's the way it is. But that wasn't so with the Passover. And to deliberately ignore it was not just a matter of preference. It was a deliberate breach of God's law, and it was sin. Listen to, us, to how God ordains it again. This is, again, in Exodus chapter 12, and now I'm skipping down to verse 24. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. It will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you 
just as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And that's where we are now. This is years later, and we're in this land of promise under King Hezekiah, and Hezekiah is calling for the renewal of this, this ordinance, but it's been ignored for years. And back now in Exodus chapter 12, verse 26. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? That you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshipped. So what we see is that it was a part of the parents' obligation to their children before the Lord. To fail to keep this ordinance and to teach it to your children was to fail them in their education and their spiritual development. In short, it was a crime against God and against their children to not hold this feast. If we move on in Exodus to chapter 13, we read this in verse 8. So we're the next chapter in Exodus, Exodus chapter 13, verse 8. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. It shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes, that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. And notice there, beloved, the personal touch which God commanded here. The Passover was kept because this is what was done for me. And that's the way they were supposed to explain it to their children from generation to generation. They were to tell them, we're keeping, we're observing this day because this is what was done for me. God liberated me from Egypt. And, and you have to catch the importance of that. We're generations away from when this event actually took place. But all the descendants had, were supposed to have that same testimony. I was delivered because my father was delivered, because my grandfather was delivered, because my great-grandfather was there on that day when God brought us out of Egypt. And that's the way covenant promises follow. Dying on the cross is what Christ did for me. And that's the witness I want to give to my children. Yes, it's generations back there, but he did it for me. And I am the recipient of those blessings. And that was what they were to convey to their children. Not that this is something that God did for our people long ago, but this is something that God did for me. It formed a tight link between God's covenant grace and his people. You know, faith is hard for children to kind of uh, turn into something personal. And it's particularly difficult if they see their parents with no personal connection with their faith. And you children who are watching tonight, we, we want you to understand that. That the relationship we have with the Lord Jesus Christ is not that he died for sinners long ago. And that's what I believe, that, that long ago he died for sinners. I believe he died for me. And your mom and dad believe that he died for them. And it's a very personal thing with us. This isn't a story of something that happened to others. It's a story of something that happened to me. Jesus came to this world and he died for me. And it happened for you. Now, this Passover was intended to demonstrate that, that they were God's special people. And that Jehovah had proved his uniqueness and power by delivering them from idolatrous Egypt and bring them into Canaan where they defeated the pagan kings who reigned there and God gave them then that land. It was a sign of their covenantal relationship with God. Of all the festivals in Israel, the most solemn was that of the Passover. It commemorated Israel's national birthday as the redeemed of the Lord 
and it pointed forward to that better deliverance of which it was the emblem, says Alfred Edersheim. So Hezekiah, knowing that both kingdoms are not only fractured from one another, but reeling under the threat of foreign powers, he makes his appeal to the whole people to repent and to return to the worship and service of the living God. As we saw in our reading tonight, Hezekiah envisioned this as the only hope for the nation as a whole and for the people individually. He summons all the Jews to Jerusalem, those from the north and those from the south in the kingdom of Judah. He does that not out of jealousy or an attempt to subjugate the north. He's not trying to, to regain uh, the, the whole kingdom uh, that his father David had had. There's no nation in the north to subjugate anymore. No, he summons them in hopes of finding mercy from the Lord for all of God's people. Matthew Henry says, Let them take whom they will for their king, says Hezekiah. So they will but take God for their God. He doesn't care who's king. He cares who their God is. And it's important to remember that it was not just Hezekiah moved by the Lord who was calling out to the tribes of the northern kingdom at this time. Prophets in the northern kingdom were doing the same thing. In fact, it's a classic situation. The Lord in mercy through King Hezekiah is gently and lovingly wooing them on the one hand to, to return to their covenant promises and to return to their God. And he, he's doing that through Hezekiah and through his prophets at the same time he's warning them that if they don't serious judgment is coming it's interesting to see those two things working together the law and the gospel Hezekiah is saying repent and come and the Lord will show us mercy and the prophets are saying there will, there will be no mercy without repentance God is going to judge you you see this beautifully played out in the prophecy of Hosea so I'm now in the prophecy of Hosea chapter 4 Hosea chapter 4 and it's worth reading all, all of Hosea's prophecy but I'm going to begin in Hosea 4 with verse 15 though you Israel play the harlot let not Judah offend do not come up to Gilgal, nor go up to Beth-Avon, nor swear an oath, saying, As the Lord lives. For Israel is stubborn like a stubborn calf. Now the Lord will let them forage like a lamb in open country. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Their drink is rebellion. They commit harlotry continually. Her rulers dearly love dishonor. The wind has wrapped her up in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Now, in those words, beloved, the Lord is specifically addressing the foolish idolatry of the northern tribes, who in the days of Jeroboam set up a golden calf to worship so that they would not have to go down to Jerusalem and worship in Solomon's temple. You don't need to turn there, but you can just listen. This is 1 Kings chapter 12. And I'm reading from verse 26. This is King Jeroboam who became the king of the northern ten tribes. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, which of course was in the kingdom of Judah, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, quote, It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as for as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places, this is Jeroboam, and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, 
like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel he installed the priests of the high places which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar, which he had made at Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. So he sets up this whole system of false worship. And what's happening here now in the days of Hezekiah, this is much later, Hezekiah is saying to these people who have been doing this for, for years, he's saying to them, abandon that and come. Come back to the Lord in Jerusalem. Come back to the temple at Jerusalem. Come back to the priests of the true living God and abandon those idols and come back and repent and see what blessings the Lord will bring to us. That's what Hezekiah was saying. Hosea was saying something different. It's the same message, but in a different form. This condemnation of the false worship of Israel is continued by Hosea in chapter 8 of his uh, prophecy. So now I'm in chapter 8. And the Lord says there in verse 5, Your calf is rejected, O Samaria. Those calves you set up to be worshipped, they're rejected. My anger is aroused against them. How long until they attain to innocence? For from Israel is even this. A workman made it, and it is not God. But the calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. The stalk has no bud. It shall never produce meal. If it should produce, aliens would swallow it up. Israel is swallowed up. Now they are among the Gentiles like a vessel in which is no pleasure. The Lord says, all these judgments are coming upon you because of your, your worshiping these calves and you're putting your trust in them and going about not only worshiping them but idols throughout the land. In verse 10, Hosea goes on in the name of the Lord. And he says, Israel empties his vine. He brings forth fruit for himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the bounty of his land, they have embellished his sacred pillars. Their heart is divided. Now they are held guilty. He will break down their altars. He will ruin their sacred pillars. For now, they say, we have no king because we did not fear the Lord. And as for a king, what would he do for us? They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Thus judgment springs up like hemlock in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of Samaria fear because of the calf of beth -Avon. For its people mourn for it, and its priests shriek for it, because its glory has departed from it. The idol also shall be carried to Assyria as a present for King Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. As for Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, her king is cut off like a twig on the water. Also the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The thorn and thistle shall grow up on their altars. They shall say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. O Israel, you have sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood. The battle of Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. When it is my desire, I will chasten them. People shall be gathered against them when I bind them for their two transgressions. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain, but I harnessed her fair neck. I will make Ephraim pull plow. Judah shall plow. Jacob shall break his clods. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. You have plowed witness, wickedness, you have reaped iniquity, you have eaten the fruit of lies, because you trusted in your own way in the multitude of your mighty men. Now can you just see these two messages coming at the same time? Hosea the prophet standing before the northern kingdom, the people of the northern kingdom, and talking about them sowing iniquity and the judgment of God that's coming on them, and then saying to them, stop and 
and sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. And then into town comes the messenger from Hezekiah, who says, come back. Come back to Jerusalem. Come back to the, to the temple of the Lord and see what blessings God has for us. So on the one hand, you have the, the judgment of God saying, turn from your sin or suffer the consequences. And on the other hand, you have the, the messenger from, from Judah coming and saying, come back and, and know the blessing of the Lord. Repent and find the sweetness of God's forgiveness. Unfortunately, as you've already seen, and we just brushed over it a moment ago, too many of them will have none of it. They make a mockery of the message of the prophets, and they make a mockery of the message of Hezekiah. And it's all to their own ruin. They're like that prisoner. They see someone making faces, and instead of seeing what's really being said to them, they hear only their own hearts, and so they lose their opportunity for liberation. Now, it's true that the, the Passover was being scheduled for the observance in the, in the second month of the new year rather than the first, as uh, was prescribed, of course, by the law of God. But there was precedent from the beginning regarding some men who had been in contact with a corpse, and so from the very start, uh, the Lord had permitted another observance of the Passover in the second month for those who, for one reason or another, were not able to participate in it on the first month. And it couldn't be done in the first month in the days of Hezekiah when he became king because it was already past the date for the keeping of the Passover when they finally got the temple cleared out and got enough priests at least consecrated to be able to start worshiping again. So they were past the date for the Passover. So... Hezekiah realizes that, and knowing that the Lord desires mercy and not sacrifice, uh, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings, and Hosea says that in chapter 6, verse 6, he determines that they'll just postpone the whole celebration of the Passover to the second month, just like was done even in the days of Moses. And it's the ver this very adjustment. And it's recorded for you in Numbers chapter 9, if you want to look at it there later. But it's this adjustment that indicates that the law of Moses was subject at the hand of God, who is the one who instituted it, to change. And it's Alfred Edersheim who points out, it indicates that it is especially susceptible to a higher and more spiritual application. That is, the law is. And that's revealed positively here by the fact that uh, they couldn't keep it on the appointed day, so the Lord in mercy says then you can do it uh, on the second month at the same time. And it's this character of the law and its susceptibility to higher understanding is negatively demonstrated by Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 5 during the Sermon on the Mount. We could reference the whole section, but just to uh, make it short for tonight. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So that's a negative example of how the law itself can be lifted up to a higher plane in understanding spiritually. This is a positive one. Mercy comes to, into play. Um, this one with Hezekiah and the moving of the and adjusting of the date. In Christ we have the negative one where we can see that uh, judgment against that sin is greater than most men would imagine. If they had waited a year, it seems that Hezekiah thought that that would not be healthy for the spiritual welfare of the people. It was important to press the advantage of the growing spiritual interest of the people now while they were warmed by the Spirit of God to action. And this is the decision of Hezekiah, and you notice everybody with him. 
Um, and you notice that the only reason that there has to be this delay was because, once again, the reluctant uh, uh, efforts of the uncooperative priests who seemed to be resisting Hezekiah in favor of the dunghill deities that they have chosen to serve and perhaps the profit they got from that service. These men, beloved, will be the destruction of Jerusalem when this revival runs its course and secures the hearts of the elect, then will come the promised judgment because of the, the, the nature of the hearts of these priests. The priests put up a passive aggressive resistance as we say today, but they're outmaneuvered by the king and though it was slow going, they eventually complied too. Now in verse 4 of Second Chronicles 30 we read, And the matter pleased the king and all the assembly, so they resolved to make a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba to Dan. This is such an important proclamation that we'll consider it with some care. But uh, here you have the grounds for it and the introduction to it. And we'll just touch on that in conclusion tonight. In the eyes of Hezekiah and the assembly or congregation, this was the right and proper thing to do, to invite all of Israel to come to Jerusalem and participate in the Passover. Some have made the point that the distinction is made here by the mentioning of the king and the people, but not the high priest or those who served him, that that reflects back on, and it reflects further on the lack of cooperation among the entrenched leaders and authorities. Now, this commanded ordinance had not been properly observed, we're told here, for a long time. And it seems that there was always a remnant of faithful servants of the Lord who, who kept such days in the best way that they could, without the cooperation of the priests or anyone else. And these were probably joined by others who danced between two opinions, as the Bible puts it. Um, worshiping Jehovah and the idols, or Jehovah as an idol. But a proper observance had not taken place in years because there had been no support for it by king or priest. It's barely understood, beloved, how quickly, observes John Trapp, the service of God can fall to the ground under bad civil and religious leaders. And yes, they both played their part in this. Civil authorities are meant, as Paul points out in Romans chapter 13, to be a terror to evil. But when they become a terror to what is good, and religious leaders join them and they're calling good evil and evil good, they pull at and they distort the whole fabric of society. And the nation begins to suffer at its very core, at its very heart, by those distortions. Hezekiah's appeal here is going to be made on the grounds of duty. He's not trying to command them to participate, participate, but rather to acknowledge that it was their place to do so before God. It's worth noting here that these people had been quick enough to respond to the invitations of men and women to all sorts of violations of God's law. Well, they were quick for that. Set up an idol. In, in the northern kingdom, sure, and, and tell us it's too hard to go to Jerusalem to worship God as he commands. Sure, we understand that, and we'll, we'll start worshiping here. It was, there was no effort given there to coerce or cajole or force the people to disobey God. There never is. This is an invitation from Hezekiah to conform to the word of God. And if nothing else bears evidence to the fallen nature of men and women, this certainly does. His or her readiness to do or to try almost anything that the world suggests or offers while showing the greatest reticence in doing what God commands. The world can't recommend anything too bizarre, too, too wild for men and women to at least try. 
We'll experiment with anything in our society. Experiment with it. But if we talk about doing what God commands, suddenly we're very shy. And we're not sure that we should be too extreme. And we need to be careful. And we need to make sure we don't go far too far with that. You don't want to become a religious fanatic. Become a fanatic in any area of sin, that's probably okay. But not with the things of God. It's understanding this reality that gives life and substance to Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7, Paul says this, For the mystery of lawlessness is already working, only he is now holding back until it comes out of the midst. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the breath of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, whose coming is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, so that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, so that all those who do not believe the truth, but delight in right unrighteousness, might be condemned. Well, runners carry this invitation to the ends of the two kingdoms, and the message is the same for all, and it's direct, and it begins with these words, and, and with this we'll, we'll wind down tonight. Children of Israel, return to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Then he will return to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the king of Assyria. So it begins here by identifying them as descendants of the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or that is Jacob. And in that position, they're supposed to be saying, this is what the Lord did for me at the Passover. The proclamation addresses all equally, the people from the north as well as the people from the south. Even their individual tribes are not significant now. It's their covenant kin kinship that they need to take stock of at this critical point. Secondly, it directly states that they are rebels against the Lord God of their fathers. The two points come together in the words of the prophet Isaiah. Through the Lord, Isaiah says this. Uh, through Isaiah, the Lord says this, excuse me, to Judah. This is Isaiah 51, verses 1 and 2. Listen to me, pursuers of righteousness, seekers of Jehovah. Look to the rock from which you were cut and to the hole the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bear you, bore you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. Come to me, come to me. And thirdly, it offers the promise that if they will abandon their rebellion and submit to God as their God, then he will be their God indeed. He will be a God to the remnant, who has escaped being carried away into bondage so far. And why not come? Why not come? What is being lost in doing so? Liberty? They have none. They don't have any liberty. They're, they're slaves. Prosperity? No, they're the servants of their enemies. And when they do manage to raise a crop, the enemy carries it off. They only serve to make their enemy rich at this point. Why not come? But notice, too, that here we see that the first sweep of revival is meant to catch the remnant. They've not been carried away, but neither have they been fully submitted to God and to his word. This is a call to those who, knowing themselves to be the children of Abraham, to be, well, the children of Abraham. That's what's a call for. And that's the way it is with revival in general, beloved. It begins with a call to those who identify loosely with Christ. It's a call to them to abandon their dedication to other things and renew their commitment to the living God. 
this passage suffers from overuse at times. But it's the Lord's promise to Solomon. And it's interesting that it comes into play at this time. Because the Lord told Solomon in that day, when the people of God have gone into the land of promise and enjoyed it, or are, are in the land of promise, this kingdom has developed, and they're enjoying it, and they find themselves lukewarm in their faith, even alienated from their God, and oppressed both, spiritual, both spiritually and physically. If then, the Lord says to Solomon, if then my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear, heal their land. And that promise goes on to talk about if they will come into the temple and humble themselves, the Lord will heal, hear from heaven. This is a call to this remnant that finds themselves weak in their faith and, and alienated from their God and oppressed spiritually and physically to come, to call upon God and let us see what he will do for us, for his people, for his kingdom. And that's the same call we have today. This is the day when revival is needed. There are many whose relationship to Christ has been quite loose. Their faith has been more sentimental than real. And they're beginning to feel alienated from him in the present circumstances and oppressed spiritually and physically. And so this is the time for the remnant to call upon the Lord who promises to hear and to answer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word for its timeless character. We see so many things here that apply to our own times and to our own day. And Lord, we pray that we would not lose sight of them. Lord, we pray that uh, we would be a people seeking revival, seeking this first sweep of revival through our land, where those loosely connected will be brought close in love and in faith and in confidence to their God. That, Lord, the, the disconnection between us and our God will be healed. And, Father, we will see you at work in our midst in ways that we have never thought possible. This is our need, Lord. We pray that you would send it through the Lord Jesus Christ. If there's anyone tonight who's listening to this and who is without Christ in his or her life, I pray, Lord, that you would help them to see that the, the road without Christ is a road of judgment, a road to death. It's not our word, it's your word to men and women everywhere. That they would hear the message of the prophets, that judgment is indeed coming. But Lord, we pray that they would also hear this gospel, this message sent out, that they wouldn't allow their prejudice and, and their distrust and their hatred of all things godly to keep them from seeing that we're just not making faces at them. We're not mocking them. We're offering to them the only thing, Lord, that can help them, the message of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Help them, Lord, to see through that in the darkness and in the light, see that our appeal is an appeal of love. And Father, we Thank you tonight for all of those that you have made your own. And we pray, Lord, that you will now bless us as only you can as we retire this evening. And now with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Good night.